Delighted to be joined here by Lord Errol. How are you, sir? Very well, thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Now, um, you are giving a presentation here. Just whet our appetites, if you will, as to what you're going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about smart cities um, because I'm chairman of Hypercat, among other things, which is an interoperability idea. Because the thing about smart, at the moment, all the stuff's driven in silos. People look at smart energy, smart water, etc. But that's not really what it's about. Uh, to my mind, in the future, and the vision is really that everything's going to be talking to each other. People who want to develop apps, they want to take something from there, mix it with something over there, meld it all together. You can't do that if you don't know what it is and what you're looking at and how to read it. So that's what Hypercat's doing. It's a top level, how do you read and look at what's out there so you can do something with it that's useful. Now, Hypercat, this is a, a British uh, initiative, British organisation. What's, what's your role with Hypercat? Well, I'm chairman of the advisory board. I'm also chairing the foundation because there will, will probably be some intellectual property at some point, which we want to be open and free. The whole idea about it is not out there to make money. It's out there to enable people to develop things, Britain to be a leader, actually the whole world, because it is, it'll go global. A um, bit like the World Wide Web, effectively, but these machines to communicate. Now, the United Nations says that very shortly we'll have something like 54% of our population living in cities. And also this growth of the Internet of Things is finally becoming a thing. This places huge pressures, but also huge challenges and opportunities for organisations looking to get the most out of this. Um, and I guess that's par partly what we're about here today. It's about making sure that everything is safe and secure, as well as realising those benefits from it. That's going to be the very difficult bit because at the end of the day you really get innovation when you can match up all these data streams. The trouble is it also opens up vulnerabilities because if I can tamper with something I can cause a lot of chaos. For instance, um, take traffic lights which will be eventually integrated because it might be useful for traffic applications to know when they're red and green so they could help stream traffic. Now if I'm a bad guy I could turn all the traffic lights red just to snarl things up. It would be really nasty to turn them green so you get pile-ups at all the junctions and there you've almost got, you could have a terrorist attack. So we've got to be very careful how we do these things, particularly when we start getting machines automatically feeding back and controlling things. The driverless car is an interesting one. Certainly is. Um, and I guess, you know, on the one hand, big data, we realise the benefits, potential from that, but also some people say big data, big brother. What do you, in, in your roles, particularly when advising on government policy, what, what do you do to try and reassure companies of, of the benefits while finding the right balance with privacy and security? I tend to err on the side, to be honest, of privacy and security. Um, I think that what people will get from the big data will be extremely useful for certain things. What worries me is if central organisations that have power over our lives and our freedom start having access to profile us because they may, particularly in the early days, make the wrong conclusion because there may be things that you do, for instance, or people you travel happen by pure coincidence to travel with who may be dodgy and you may get tarred with the same brush and that will be very dangerous. Uh, finally, for now, the show that we're at today is very much uh, historically about physical access, about physical security. But as we've just been discussing, the industry is moving much towards uh, a, a digital approach and realising the, the, the digital challenges involved. For professionals who maybe have been involved in physical security for a number of years, what would you say to them in order to keep their tools sharp and, and themselves relevant moving into this digital security age? It's, um it's not as different as all that anyway, it's just a means of communication, so therefore it's another uh, attack vector you might look at. But at the end of the day, the physical security is still required. You physically need to move around, you physically need to protect things. It's just that suddenly you're opening up an electronic attack vector instead of it being a physical key that turns the lock. So all you need to do is learn out what the vulnerabilities are, um, how that could happen, and think about the pathways where you could inadvertently open up a vulnerability. Sometimes the best thing would be to take down, say, the electricity supply so the power goes out, so things fail open, so people can run in the door. So you've used um, an, a, what's a, a physical attack to generate an electronic attack, effectively, which ends up being a physical attack by people running in. So it's just melding the two things and getting your head around the fact there's another attack vector. And if you don't understand exactly how that works, which you, no one will, I mean, no one knows everything, just the electronic people don't know about physical, you've just got to be talking and be in groups together that talk, discuss and think. Yes, collaborate, yes. exactly. Collaborate. Uh, Lord Errol, thank you so much for joining us today and have a terrific uh, time at the show. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. Looking forward to it. Yes, me too. Bye for now.